Thanks, bud. Okay, um, before I start on just the notes for this section here, quick review of what we've been talking about recently. Um, our, our units on functions. What is a, a function? Well, in case you forgot, here's like a definition. A function is an equation. We can draw a function as a graph. We can write a table of values, but I mean, essentially it's an equation where you plug in numbers. And up until this point in your math careers, you guys have learned like this sort of function, a linear function. This has a slope of three, a y-intercept of four. Uh, and more recently, we've been working on quadratic functions, which could take a lot of different formats. Uh, this could be a quadratic function. Tell me something about that quadratic function. What's it going to look like as a graph? Sure, smiley face works. It's going to open upwards. What's the y-intercept? Good. Okay, so that's in vertex. No, that's in standard form. If we write an equation like, say, this. Oh my goodness, come on, Chris. x minus 2 squared plus 3. This format is useful because it tells you where the vertex is. Um, this format's useful because it tells you where your x-intercepts are. Does that make sense? Well, ultimately, so far, though, we've either learned how to draw a straight line graph or we've learned how to do like a, a quadratic. Uh, going forward then for the rest of this unit, this unit we're going to show you two new functions, three new functions, and then next year with grade 12 math, then we're going to show you many, many, many more. And basically the whole goal is, is almost always the same. I'm going to show you a new equation, and we're going to talk about what the graphs look like. So today's topic then is absolute value. I put this one here because we've mentioned absolute value already. You guys remember the idea? If I ask you to absolute value 5, the answer is 5. If I ask you to absolute value negative 7, though, the answer is 7. Right? Because you don't, you just ignore any negative signs. Right? Well, here's what that looks like as a graph. It actually has a lot of purpose with something like, say, a bank shot in pool. If you were to have a graph, let's say that you plugged in 1. The answer would be 1. 2 would give 2, 3 would give 3, 4 would give 4. It would normally look linear. But if you were going to have a negative number, this is where negative numbers for x normally would be. Negative numbers would give negative Brady y's. Rabbit, please come to the office. Now what ends up happening Brady is Rabbit, they become positive. Come to the and it makes a graph that looks like a V. This is what an absolute value graph looks like. It looks like a V. Anything that would have been negative is now up here in the positive and say. So it leads to some kind of cool questions that you can answer, often involving like pool or or something that has like a kick. There's actually a lot of physics overlap with absolute values. Uh, if I teach any of you guys physics next year, one of the unit is on optics, and that would be like if you had like a laser that was shot at a mirror and it kind of goes in at a certain angle, how does it bounce out kind of things? So, so let's sketch this graph. I've already kind of shown you what it looks like. It would normally be like a perfectly straight line like this. And it looks like this. That's an absolute value graph. Does that make sense? Okay, let's show it on the calculators though. Okay, at first, I'd like you guys to learn how to do this the long way, and then after I show you how to do something the long way, then I'm going to show you the shortcut in a second. If I wanted to try, to try to graph this thing, we're actually going to use two different graphs. If you guys remember when we did absolute values, it involved cases. We have to do case one and case two. Case one would be where you just let y equal x. I'm just going to type that in here, y equals x. But I'm not done yet. I'm going to keep going, though. Case 2 is where you have to let y equal negative x, because if x was negative, then the double negative would remake it positive. So we're going to type in two different equations, one for x and one for negative x. 
and it's going to look something like this if I grab it. Okay. We then have to selectively ignore part of the graph and recognize that this whole bottom half of the graph right here doesn't actually exist. That makes sense? So the longhand way of typing in an absolute value graph is you actually type in two different graphs. One, the regular one. The second one, you just throw a negative in front. And then what I might recommend is for your window, you know how I like your windows going from negative 10 to positive 10? Well, in the Ys, it's not possible to have negative Y values anymore, so just start it at zero. And now it'll look like a V, just because I pretended the bottom half of the graph just wasn't there. Does that make sense? Okay, That's the long way of doing it. There is a shorter way, though. So here's the shorter way. Uh, go back to Y equals and clear everything out. Uh, if you go second catalog, did I show you guys this already, where to find ABS? So second and then press zero to take you to the catalog. The catalog is like literally every single function your calculator can do. Do you guys have ABS as like the first one on yours? Have I shown you this before or no? Okay, so go second and then zero. See how behind zero it says catalog? It'll bring up literally every single thing your calculator can do. And fortunately, the very first one is absolute value. And then just put an X inside of it. If you have a fancier new calculator, it might actually put those like vertical bars rather than mine. So. Um, now, if I go back to like a regular old fashioned zoom, it actually will make it just look like a V. And you know how I had to ignore the bottom half? Now I don't even have to do that because my calculator is it for me. So that's how you graph absolute value. Zero is the lowest number you can have. Let's put it that way. I, I can pretty much guarantee that it should not go into the negatives because if you had a negative number, it would just remake it positive. So the lowest number is zero. You can absolute value some other funny looking graphs. Like, for example, you want to have a nation? Okay. Uh, let's say we didn't absolute value x. Let's say we absolute valued. Um, x squared minus 4. Uh, before I do that, I'm just going to show you what x squared minus 4 normally looks like. Here's what x squared minus 4 should normally look like. When I absolute value this graph, what's going to happen is everything that is in the negatives won't be in the negatives. It is just going to flip over. So now I'm going to show you the other graph. Now this is what it'll look like. You can almost imagine where this would be useful in everyday life scenarios. In my mind, I think of like someone bouncing a basketball. And something comes in, it bounces, it goes up, and it bounces. Right? Now, you can't use the whole graph, because obviously if I bounce a basketball, it won't go down, bounce like this, and then shoot back up again. That's not going to be how physics works. But I mean, at least for the first bounce, that could occur. Does that make sense? So, long story short, you can't have anything in the negative. If it's in the negative, it just kind of flips over top and becomes positive. Does that work? Okay. Let's try some examples then. So, uh, the most common question I'm going to give you is probably going to involve pool. And I think to me, this just it makes sense. The idea of if you were some sort of pool grandmaster and you knew how all these angles worked, really, it's it's physics and math. If you wanted to do like one of these bank or kick shots, whatever it is, where like you shoot the, the ball at this one here and then it banks off the edge and goes in, one of the rules is that whatever this angle right here is, is the same as that angle right here. Like it should be perfectly symmetrical in a V. Right. So. Okay, um, just like with other functions though, absolute values have leading coefficients. What does a leading coefficient do to a graph? Well, earlier it makes it from being like a smiley face to a brownie face. Well, rather than it being like a, a V, it could make a graph be an upside down V. That's all. Yeah, let me give you an example. If it was negative 3 absolute value of X, what this does is it takes a graph that normally is a V, but the negative 3 outside guarantees the number is negative. Does that make sense? And so this turns the graph upside down. The three just kind of changes the squish factor. Um, slope is probably the best word to use. Like the number affects the slope and the direction. Hmm. 
What would negative 2 absolute value x of look like? Without even using your calculator. Yeah, it's going to be upside down. And rather than being like a, uh, a graph like this, this is, this is what it would be if it was upside down. The 2 is just going to make it like a little bit steeper. So it would look something more like this. That was pretty bad. It should be symmetrical. Clearly, I've not drawn it symmetrical very well. But does that make sense? So when you're typing that into your calculator, would you go negative 2 and then absolute value? Or should it just do absolute value and then negative 2? No, very good question. You have to first put the negative 2 in, then you have to absolute value the x. Because what you're doing is you're telling it first absolute value x. Basically, it's like bed mass. It's doing the brackets first. And I guarantee you that number has to be positive. But then you're timesing that positive number by negative 2. So it has to be negative then. So then hopefully this graph looks kind of like what I just drew. Ish. Can you kind of envision the bank shot? It's almost like the, uh, the axis right here is the edge of the pool table. And it's going to go bang and then bank down the other way. Cool. Okay. Um, we can also do this for taking the reciprocal of other functions. I've kind of already showed you guys this one a little bit. Let's say I to ask you to take the absolute value of x plus 2. Let's just use our graphing calculators for this. Uh, before I actually do the, the absolute value of x plus 2, I'm just going to type in what x plus 2 would be. That's what x plus 2 would look like. What's going to happen when I absolute value it? Well, everything over here that was negative will now flip up and become positive. That's all. So then if I absolute value it, see how it's still a V? But what's happened, though, is rather than the, uh, like the point of the thing right being there at 0, 0, by making it absolute value of x plus 2, which normally would have been over here, it kind of moves the point of the v to being like there instead. It just shifts it a little bit. I kind of already did this one right here. x squared minus 4 would normally look like this. But if I absolute value it, what ends up happening is this just little bit like just flips up and you get kind of that little bounce concept here. I don't know. In my head, I think bouncing a basketball. It comes in, it bounces, hits the ground, then this next little bounce. Uh, one of the questions on your assignment that you've had to skip up until now basically asks you, um, I think it says something like this, uh, f of x equals 3x plus 4. Well, hopefully you can graph 3x plus 4. You know roughly that it looks like this. That makes sense. And then the next question says g of x equals the absolute value of f of x. All that means to do is take the graph that used to look like this and just make it look like that instead. So just put the absolute value sign around 3x plus 4. That makes sense. And then it just makes it that whatever was negative is not positive. That's all. It's actually kind of an easy thing to work with. All right, so just more of the same. What would the absolute value graphs look of these ones here? Well, for this graph, all of this stuff right here was positive. It stays positive. See how this stuff is in the negatives? It's just going to flip and do that. There. Looks like a V. This one right here, all of this stuff up here stays like that. This little bit right here kind of flips up to there. Looks kind of like a W. One year, uh, I think it was Will, I think it was Cody. Um, managed to try to find a way to draw a Batman symbol on his calculator. 
because it kind of looks like this a little bit. If you then try to find a way to make another one down like this, it kind of like made a made like a Batman symbol out of it. <laughs> I don't know. I think that was Cody Van Dusten that did that. Like him and Will were messing around with the graphs. Does that make sense? All right, moving on. Um, honestly, you guys can handle this. Let's just do the last one then. Tell me something about this graph right here before we absolute value it. What's it going to look like before it's absolute value? Should have been quadratic. Smiley face or frowny face? Y intercept? So it should have been at negative 6. Let's try doing it without our graphing calculators just to practice those skills again. This is in standard form. What are the other forms we can convert to? Vertex, and we can also factor it. I'm going to factor it. This guy factors to x plus 6 and x minus 1. Why is that helpful? How does that help me out? What was that? Yeah, we have our x-intercepts. They're at negative 6 and positive 1. I think I roughly know what the graph looks like now. Um, let's try converting to vertex form, just for practice, because it's going to suck. How do you convert to vertex form? All right, there's no leading coefficient, so that's our first step. That's done. Uh, throw the plus 6 way the heck over there. We need to work with that 5. What's half of 5? And then we have to square it. I'll need help with that. I don't know about Two and a half squared. Okay, so we got to go x squared plus 5x. We're going to add 6.25, and we're going to subtract 6.25. Does that work so far? That should have been a minus 6, shouldn't it? Just thinking out loud here. That should be a minus 6. Why don't I actually do that properly? Okay, and then the next step, I guess we can do both simultaneously. That'll be negative 12 and a quarter. And then for the other bit, this guy right here should be something squareable. Perfect square is the, I think the term we use. Uh, it's going to be x plus a number. What's that number? Two and a half. Yeah, it's whatever the five was cut in half. Right. What, what was this helpful for? Yeah, I know where the vertex is now. Uh, it's at negative two and a half. Up there. And then it's way down here at negative 12.25. Just off my graph here. But now I have enough to know roughly what this graph should have looked like. It should look like that. Does that make sense? All right, that being said, you can do that with your calculator too. I tell me grade 12 is a lot. I don't know that I say it to you guys enough. Um, if I'm doing my job well as a teacher, I shouldn't just let you use your calculator all the time, though. I mean, a calculator is a good tool for increasing your efficiency, but it doesn't actually help your math skills, if that makes sense, if you just always default to your calculator. There's a time and place for it, but it does, I mean, if you actually want to be good at math, you probably shouldn't be always just, let's graph another calculator. I mean, it's harder, obviously, to do it by hand, but isn't that kind of the point? The exercise makes you better at it. Yeah. Anyways, um, now that we know that this is what it originally looks like, what happens when we absolutely value it? Well, all of this stuff that I just do down there in the negatives is actually way up here in the positives instead. There, this should be what the graph looks like. A um, couple last thoughts, and then I think we can call it a day almost. This is a short lesson. 
What would um, sometimes I ask you things like find me the x-intercepts, the y-intercepts, uh, the domain, the range. Sometimes I ask you to find some of those points. What would the x-intercepts be for this graph? Yeah, one and negative six. I mean, we already found them way back here, right? They'd be at um, one and zero, negative six and zero. Where's your y-intercept? Yeah, it was supposed to be at negative six, but then we flipped it up, right? So now it's at positive six. I feel like I haven't talked enough about domain and range, so maybe I should give a brief tutorial on that. Domain refers to all of the x numbers that you're allowed to use. Um, if this was like a diver jumping off the diving board, you really can't have negative x numbers because you can't have negative time. But for a function like this, is there any x value that you can't use? I would say no, you can use anything you want. So the notation that you might have learned is x with like a fancy e and then a capital R. Have I chatted with most of you guys about that notation at some point? It means x is an element of the reals. It just refers to the fact that you can use any x you want. They're all... There's no, there's no exceptions. The next function we learn, though, that's going to change. And there will be some x values you can't use. At least for now, that's what it is. Uh, your range on an absolute value graph is almost always guaranteed to be this. Why has to be greater than or equal to zero? Why is it almost guaranteed have to be that? Yeah, it can't be negative. Can it be zero, though? Yeah, zero stays at zero. So and basically, you're just saying that y is going to be greater than zero. In theory, this should always happen, but there, there are a couple of exceptions, but I don't imagine that you're, those are going to come up in, in our class. Uh, they will a lot more in grade 12, though, the more, more we work with functions. Anyways, that's pretty much my lesson. Um, the question then is, can you now use the knowledge of what an absolute value graph looks like in order to, uh, in order to do a question? I think the one in your assignment is about a pool shot where like the idea is, is you've got a pool table that looks something like this and you kind of shoot a, an original shot that looks like this and then it bounces back and it looks like this. And that's your job to kind of figure out will the pool ball make it into the corner pocket or not. So. Any questions? Okay. Um, if you haven't finished the previous assignment, it's a little late, but I'll still take it obviously. Um, but hopefully you're most of the way through assignment number six, seven. Leland Bastine, please come to the office. So, uh, Leland Bastine, please come to the office. If you want it to be on time. So. But hopefully you're, I mean, I know a couple of you guys are a decent way done already. So. Okay, cool. Uh, take a break as you need to. I'm, I guess I'm done for the day. Let me know how I can help.